so glad you're all here. And I got to speak to about 75% of you. But uh, the other ones, I'll see them the way out the door. Um, we're so glad that you're here and that we're all able to be together. Amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is good. Um, now, an update on the, the, the bales. The, uh, the um, Buford was, he, he had it scheduled for them to go into the steeple on Tuesday, Tuesday. He came in and opened up all the boxes, and they had forgotten to send us four parts. They have to go up in the steeple. So they ordered them. They're here now, and so now we're back on the schedule to get them back up into the steeple. So it's going to be happening really soon, but uh, we had to get all the all our little bits in a row. And so uh, he's got that together, and if you notice, the steeple has already been cleaned. And so make sure you notice that on the way out the door. Um, next Sunday, we're not having you for the, uh, the children's classes, but this Sunday we will, and then the following week we will, but next Sunday we won't. And, yes, ma'am? Two things, just remember there's a list out to sign up for food for children, of course, we'll skip the next month. Just reminding people it's out there and that y'all will get putting one out there for each month. And the other thing is, I just want to, I was having a sneak by here yesterday to see the Clinton people, and there was a busy bee up in the shrubs cutting down all of those vines that have been driving me crazy, and that thanks goes to Diane Blaney, and she spent all half the day getting those vines down. They look great, y'all be sure to look. That's right. Thank you. Um, now, uh, this has slipped my mind, and I don't think about it till like a Sunday before it's time. But I thought about it a month before it's time this time, so I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> the uh, shoe boxes, we've got to get, uh, it's about that time. The boxes are downstairs. Oh, you remember it too? I got the brochure. <laughs> All right, well, I'll let you take it from here. But the boxes are downstairs in the room with the big TV in it. Okay. Mm -hmm. There will be a bucket in the foyer if you want to bring things to donate for Samaritan's Purse. You can put it in the bucket in the foyer and then the youth will take it down and distribute it amongst the shoe boxes. If you want to bring your own shoe box, all of this information will be in the foyer and has all of your, um, your envelope if you want to send your money with it. We usually take up the donation at the church and then your... Um, I started to say stickers, but your uh, information right here to check the age group and whether it's for boy or girl. Make sure that is on the outside of your shoe box, take to the outside. And another thing that um, I saw this uh, past week whenever I was looking, if you do your shoe box um, on the inside of the lid, do a little prayer for that child. Um, you know, just say, like, you know, praying for you or something and sign your name right. or you can write something or send a little note with your box. And I think that'd be really good for us to do. Uh, but those will be due, I think, the second week of November. That's is right. when they start collecting. So probably due here at the church by the first Sunday in November so the youth will have time to pay <coughs> And then if you're wondering what stuff to bring, if you want to just bring some stuff, if you brought socks, that's fine. If you brought deodorant, that's fine. As long as it's hard deodorant, because I don't know how they are about any liquid traveling. Uh, and so I would steer away from any kind of a liquid or, a, or something that's going to squeeze out of the bottle, because you just, unless you check the list. But if you don't have a list to check, toothbrushes are good. Um, and I send toothpaste. And on these little brochures that you'll get, it tells you gift ideas. And in the bottom corner, it says, do not send things like candy. You know, we used to send hard candy all the time. Sure. Can't send candy, can't send gum, can't send toothpaste, um, seeds, sure. can't send food, liquids, lotions, anything breakable. But all of that is in this brochure. Okay. 
and like I said, if you so like if you were to say that you had a toll rate that you wanted to see and that little toll rate be down like I don't know, ten of them, that'd be just fine. Bring them the little things and then we'll make sure that they get shooted into the boxes. And, and if so, you eat happy meals, save the toys from the happy meals because they make great fillers when you have a little empty spot in that box to kind of shove them in that corner and finish filling that box. Wash rags, you know, yeah. just Different things that um, that you think might be a help as a hygiene issue, or then also that might be something fun, or a Bible or something. In the Lord, the Lord will bless it. And I wouldn't be surprised if somebody didn't speak English and you see an English Bible when you went to China. That when you got there, it'd be a Chinese Bible. <laughs> God can do anything. Uh, uh, are there any other announcements? Well, if there are no other announcements, we stand as we reaffirm our faith together. I believe that God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the Son of the Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born the Virgin Mary, suffered in the mighty fire, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He has stood in heaven and stood at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life of the Lord.
prayer we did in the prayer request on uh, Tuesday, which is the 12th, and 6 p.m. is the charge conference. And I've, I've sent out the uh, Zoom codes and such if you wanted to be part of that, a few people. But uh, uh, anyway, if you want that, the Zoom codes, and you do not have them for Tuesday at 6, uh, let me know, or Miss Gail, or Miss Rita, or uh, I think Bonnie and Nancy have it. And there, there's a few that have it, but I, I know I sent it to them, and I said, y'all just get it out. I think Wanda got it. And so uh, if uh, y'all want to be a part of that, get a hold of them, or come up here to the office here at the church at 6 p.m., and uh, we'll have the, uh, the church conference by Zoom. Uh, now, the other announcement that I forgot was um, last Sunday, when we the first Sunday of the month with the communion, we're going to start taking up a mission offering. And uh, so there were some that called their money to the altar. And if you thought about that later and you thought, oh, I don't want to do that, uh, that you can give that money to Miss Carolyn or to Miss Wonder or Miss Gail. And, and, and it will end up getting into the missions uh, uh, only for, uh, for the missions that are an outreach of the church. Now, let's have prayer requests. Continue to remember
22, starting in verse 22, Genesis 32, verse 22. I like that all the way my Savior leads me. I haven't sung that song in church in a long time. I like it. Genesis 32, verse 22. And he arose that night and took his two wives and his two female servants and his eleven sons, and he crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them over the brook and sent over what he had, then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place, when I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. <clears throat> Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his head. The word of God for the people of God. You know, Jacob wrestled with God. But he didn't just wrestle with God. He also at first wrestled with his brother. He started out that way. You know, whenever he was coming out, when he was being born, he said he had grabbed a hold of his brother's foot. The heel. One who seizes the heel. He wrestled with his daddy. Think about how he cheated his daddy. Oh, she cheated his brother out of that. Remember, he gave him the total suit and gave it to his brother and said, I'll give it to you for your birthright. Cheated him out of his birthright. Then later on, he cheats his father and says, No, no, I'm, I'm your other son. He says, okay, okay, I'll, I'll bless you. Come on, Esau. He waited, Esau. Then he ends up going to the house of Laban, his mother's brother, his uncle Laban's house. And then Laban, you find out where Jacob got it, it's a family trait. And Laban cheats Jacob. And then Jacob works for Laban and works for him for years, over a decade. And then finally Jacob wants out. And if we have read a few verses over, if you want to write it down, it's in chapter 31, verse 10, that you know he wants out and he wants to be set free from Laban. But he also needs to have enough money to start his family out. I mean, he's got 11 kids. And so, God gives him in a dream, in chapter 31, verse 10, he tells him, he shows him how to be able to overcome, how to prevail, and how to succeed over Laban. And Jacob follows God's order. And he's able to succeed, he's able to overcome, he's able to prevail. But you know, you would look at that and think that whenever Jacob started out, that what, what he was doing is he's on his way on a journey to have to go back to his brother 
and apologize. And he's afraid of his brother. Oh, God delivered me from my brother. But you know what? God had a different journey that he really had Jacob on that day. Jacob thought his own journey just to go back to his brother and that God is going to give him direction on how to be able to get out of this one too. But that's not at all what God's doing. God's going to different God. He's going to get him out of it, sure. But that's not what he's going to do to start with. But God's total initiative there was to get Jacob alone with God. So that God could work with Jacob. So that God could reason with Jacob. And that God could pass by Jacob and change Jacob. And that's why it says there, first of all, did you notice that it says the place of the place is called the place that this took place at. Two words, place, different ways. Called Peniel, face of God. But at this place, face of God, Jacob has to face his own reality. Jacob has to face the idea of who he really is and what kind of a man he really is. That's why the angel said to him, what is your name? He knew Jacob's name, but he wanted Jacob to have to voice it because of what the word means. It means cheer. And so he said, what is your name? Say what you are, what you have become. Cheater. I don't want to be a cheater, God, but that's who I am. And you say, you don't want to be a cheater? Yes, I don't want to be a cheater, God, but I don't know how to change. And God says, do you want to change? And he's wrestling with it. And he says, okay, I'll change you. Don't worry. I can take care of this. In fact, I'm even going to give you a new name. You're no longer going to be called Jacob. You're going to be called Israel. One who now has power with God. Because you've wrestled with God and with men, and you, you're an overcomer, you've prevailed. And so we blessed him. Now, he also has something else that he walks away with. He walks away with a leader. So if you saw Jacob and he came to you, it would be kind of like this. He, he would limp. And the limp that he has to turn around for the rest of his life is for a couple of things. One is to remind him of that day at Pentecost. And then it's also to, to know that, you know, sometimes we have to go through things and we have to wrestle with things. And, and it doesn't, you don't get out on the other side without Something haven't happened to you. You have battle scars sometimes. Sometimes the battle scars no one else sees. But you know they're there. And God knows they're there. Many times those battle scars are in here. Many times they're in here. And you don't know what to do with them. But you can use those for the use of the Lord. And so it was a reminder to Jacob and to all who saw him. And can't you imagine if somebody comes up and says, Jacob, what happened to you? And he says, well, let me tell you what happened. Why wow, yeah. him? And I'm no longer Jacob, by the way. The Lord has given me a new name. I'm Israel. Because God bless you. Oh, what a difference since God passed by. Now let me tell you what the sermon came from. You know, a lot of times my own personal worship time comes from, you know, I'll find a song on YouTube or ministry, something that ministers to me. And what happened this week is there was this song that it's called Since Jesus Passed By. And, and I've never heard the song before, and so I was really taken with it. And it was uh, played and sung by this lady named Kim Collinsworth. She's a lady who... Uh, uh, when she was a little girl, she said that her daddy was a pastor and said that, uh, that she remembered him preaching on a sermon and talking about a gift. And she said, I asked God, God, I want a gift like that. And she went into her bedroom that night. She was about 10 or 11 years old. And she puts her hands up. She said, I remember stretching my fingers up to the Lord. And said, Lord, give me a gift like that. 
Oh, Lord, use me. Give me a gift that I can use for you. Then within weeks, the Lord will give her more in her fingers. And she is a grand pianist. She doesn't play by music. I, I imagine she can read music. But she plays like Dino. And you'll have to listen to her on YouTube. Her name's Kim Collinsworth. And, uh, and I mean, and she just when she's up there doing it, you can tell she's worshiping the Lord and she's not arrogant in the least about it. I mean, it's an absolute gift from the Lord. But this is the song, and it says, Since Jesus passed by, and I thought I could play it, but I, I wasn't able to, so I'm just going to sing it a cappella for you. And I want you to hear the word. It says, Like a blind man, I wondered, so lost and undone, a beggar is so helpless. Without God or His Son, then my Savior in His mercy heard and answered my cry. And oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. Since Jesus passed by. Since Jesus passed by. Oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. Now listen to this part. Well, I can't explain it. And I cannot tell you why, but oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. Can't explain it, cannot tell you why, but oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. I think about Jacob with that struggle. He's struggling with himself. He's struggling with his brother. He's struggling with his father. He struggles with God. You know, a lot of people have struggles, different struggles. And then this is where uh, I thought about a story that uh, Wayne Webster would have told us. It comes from a book that's from a grand pastor who was an orator. His name is Fred Craddock, and I've called his name several times, but uh, Anyway, this book, he tells stories of his life and different things that happened, and he's using stories and sermons. And this is the story. Fred Craddock went to preach a revival years ago, somewhere in Georgia, most likely, because that was where most of his ministry was. He was a professor over at Emory, a preaching professor for many, many years. I was the best preaching professor Emory's ever had. Anyway, uh, he went to preach this revival, and this pastor said, Oh, Brother Craddock said, When you come to the church, said, We're having a funeral. Uh, this man has passed away, and uh, whenever you come, depending on what time you get there, we may be in the fellowship hall, and we may be, you know, still in the funeral. He said, But I want to introduce you to some of the people. So come on. And so he did. And so uh, they got there, and it was right after they had gotten done with the meal, and everybody's getting in their cars to leave. And Brother Craddock says to the, uh, to the, to the pastor of the church, well, I'm, I'm here, but you know, I don't want to interrupt anything. And he says, oh, you brought, I want to introduce you to the widow. And so he walks over to the car, and the lady has three small children, a widow. Now, because her husband has just passed away. And Brother Craddock looks at her and says, Ma'am, I'm so sorry for your loss. I don't imagine I'll be seeing you this week, but I hope to get to see you again. And she said, Oh, no, Brother Craddock, I'll be there tonight. She said, You don't understand. I'll be there tonight, I'll be there tomorrow night, and I'll be there Sunday morning, and I'll be there with my children. She said, you see, this is my church family. And they're the ones that are going to care for me and see me through this tough time. And yes, it is tough. But I'm going to get through it with the help of God and with the help of a praying church family. I'll see you tonight. And she did. And I thought, oh, wow. What a difference a praying church family. That's what church is supposed to look like. Isn't it such a blessing to have a praying church family like that? And thank y'all for having that prayer list printed as you have. 
And I saw people writing as we were adding names to it. You know, I, I thought about Jacob's struggle. And we all have a struggle that we go through. Paul had a struggle. Paul, on that road to Damascus, he thinks he's going after one thing. And God has him going after an errand of something totally different. Paul is on that road to Damascus. And God says, this is where I have you headed. And then Paul says, yes, sir. And all of a sudden, what a difference it's made in Paul's life because Jesus passed by. You know, whenever um, I was a young man, I remember my daddy telling me that he had polio when he was about 11 years old. But I didn't know any more details than that. I never asked. But here about six months ago, a year ago, something like that, it's been in recent months, that Dad told me the whole story. Because I remember thinking, now if you have polio, you usually end up with, you know, one leg shorter than the other or something. And I was thinking, Dad doesn't have that. That's odd. Well, uh, one day he decides to start telling me the story about it. And this is what happened. They were, my grandfather was pastoring a church just north of Dale High, Louisiana. And it was a Baptist church. It was called Richton Baptist Church up there. And they were a praying church. Well, that, my grandmother noticed that, uh, like these mothers who have mother's intuition, she knew something was wrong with her son. And she said, something's wrong with him. I've got to carry him to the doctor. So she put him in the car, and she took him to the doctor. And she said, I don't know what's wrong, but something's wrong with Joe. And so the doctor ran several tests, and he couldn't pinpoint it, but he could tell that there was something wrong. And so he said, wait a second. He said, Joe, put your feet together. And he said, touch your toes. And Dad couldn't even touch his knees. And he said, uh, he said, is that as far as you can reach? And he said, yes. And he said, okay. And he run one more test. And so he said, I'll be keeping Joe overnight in the hospital. And he said, so he followed the nurse. And then he said, Miss Melly said, if I've not missed it, he said, your son has polio. And by morning, he's going to be paralyzed from here down. Um, so uh, we're going to keep him and do all we can. And, what, and she said, he told me, he said, what we're hoping is that the polio doesn't go to his lung. Because if it does, some of y'all who were old enough to remember polio, uh, that would mean that you die. And so uh, it's, it, it's to be a terrible thing. And so that was Wednesday afternoon. Grandmother goes to the church that night. They start church at 530. And they have RAs and GAs at 530. And they have classes for the adults. Some of y'all are bringing back good memories, right? And, uh, and then, after that, they go to prayer meeting at 6.30. The reason I'm telling you these times is guess what time they let out from prayer meeting? 9 o'clock. This is the church that they would go through and they would pray and they would all... And y'all see those kind of prayer meetings where we sit in the pews and then one person would pray and another person would pray and another person would pray. And you keep on going until you can make your way around. And he said there was always 25 people at church, so he said that might wouldn't have been any different. Dad wasn't there because he's in the hospital. And he said they'd been at church that night praying, and if it went as normal, they would have went out at 9 o'clock. He said the only thing I can tell you that I know is different about that night is that they said they went to the altar that night, and it was not normal for that church to go to the altar and pray. They usually pray in their pews, but they did. And I don't know how long they were there. But now let's get back to the hospital because I can tell you what I do know. Dad said that he's in the bed, he went to sleep, and about 2 o'clock in the morning, he felt something hot. He said a good kind of hot, not a, not a bad hot, but like God's moving in his back kind of hot. And he said it was hot, hot as fire. And God was doing something in his back. And all of a sudden, he began to feel within himself. Like that song said, I cannot 
I'll tell you why. But oh, what a difference when Jesus passed by. All of a sudden, he said, I begin to feel within myself that I could do sit-ups. And so he said, I begin to do some sit-ups in the bed. And I was able to do them. And he said, I did 25, and I did more. And he said, and then I began to realize that I could do push-ups. And so I just said, I got out of the bed, I got down on the hospital floor there at Bell High Hospital. And he said, I began to do push-ups, and about that time, the nurse walked in. And said, young man, what are you doing out of bed? I've got to give you a shot. And so, you know, and then he got better and better and better, and he was healed. Oh, what a difference a praying church makes. And then I began to think about our church. And I thought about praying people of God. We have these prayer lists. You know, if you have something you need to be praying about, or you want others to pray for, I'm going to ask everybody else a question now. Do we all pray like that? We all pray day and night. Lift these up to the Lord. <coughs> Lift these prayer lists up. And, and you don't even have to call out every name, but if you'll just lift them up to the Lord and say, Lord, touch these people. Lord, these people who need a healing. Lord, these people who need to hear from you. Oh, Lord, these people who need comfort. Oh, God, these people who need protection. Oh, God, these people who are struggling with something. Meet their needs. Change their life. And hold those up to the Lord. Not honor that. Do that. So you need to pray in church. We've got it. Praise the Lord for it. I went to see Mary and Bell this week. Actually yesterday. And Mr. Mel told me before I left, he said, he said, Brother Rod, he said, I know Mary's on the prayer list. He said, that Mary needs your prayers. Oh, please pray for Mary. That's what he said. And then immediately I thought about this sermon, and I thought about the prayer list, and I thought about telling y'all that. Where's one at the other church? Gail Harper. Y'all, a lot of y'all are probably not him. He's got esophagus cancer. And it's in his lint nose. I'm going to see you here just a little bit up to Anderson. Gail needs your prayers. And he's always been really afraid of cancer. And now he's having to face that. So be praying for him. We know God can do miracles. And this is what was told to me when I was told that he had that. Said, you know, they gave him and they told him how much longer he had to live and that kind of thing. And, and then they said, but you know, Jack, Jack Mayhap was given that exact same prognosis and here he's still here. So be praying. Believe in God for a miracle. We know God can do it. He's more than able. And that's also why, you know, if you notice a lot of times I'll pray, I'll say, Lord, we pray for things we don't even know to pray for. Because when we pray like that, you know what that means? We were praying for Miss Mary and for Dale Harper last week before we even knew that it was as much of a dire situation as it is. And there's other ones that we're praying for that have the same needs. Maybe you have those kind of struggles. Maybe you have things that you're dealing with. And you need Jesus to pass by. Maybe you're in that struggle with that wrestling with God. And you're saying, don't let me go till you bless me, O Lord. And you know what? The Lord's going to bless you. The Lord's going to be with you. And He's not going to let us go. Until we close our eyes in death, and all of a sudden we we'll look up and say, Oh, there you are, Jesus. And he'll say, Come on. Come on, John. Never leaves us for a second. So keep on praying and know that other people are praying for you as well. Let's pray. Lord, we 
Lord God, we thank you for this day. And Lord, I pray for these people that we call out. And Lord, for the people who are on this prayer list. And Lord, for people who are unspoken. And we lift those up. Oh God, hear our prayer. We know that we have power with God. This is she told Jacob. He's no longer the man he used to be, but he's who you want him to be. Because you touched him. When you pass my, I will pass my eyes, oh God. Pass my eyes, oh Lord. Today. Right here. Thank you, Lord. We receive it. In Jesus' name. <clears throat> Our heavenly invitation is hymn number 480. You can only trust him. Let's stand and sing the first and second stand. It's hymn number 480. <laughs> Jesus' name.